talk to you. Into our class. If you haven't already, let's take our phones or watches or tablets or anything else that makes a noise and turn it on off, silent, or vibrate, please. bit shy getting started this morning. Hopefully some more will trickle in over the next little while. Is there anything that's new that we need to add to our list for a, a quick prayer before we get into class? Yes, sir. This Friday? Anybody else? All right. Let's go ahead and begin with a prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful for this day that you have given us. Grateful for an opportunity, Father, to meet together with those who are like-minded, who have the same desires in life, who have the same values in life, they were striving for the same morals and unity, Father, that we would be the Christians, the family that you would have us to be as we attempt to the best of our ability to live a life that is pleasing in your eyes, that we may be able to see you and each other for all of eternity. Father, we thank you for all of the many blessings that you have offered to us that are so easy for us to overlook, things that are easy for us to take for granted and to forget about. We pray, Father, that we don't take these things for granted, that we are are purposefully mindful of all that you have given us, that we will keep close to our minds, Father, the things that you have provided for us, and we will show you our gratitude for them and our appreciation for them. We pray, Father, that we will be willing to tell others about the blessings in our life, knowing that they came from you. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we take advantage of each day that you have given us, that we don't waste our time or waste our resources, that we don't waste our energy, Father, or all of the things that you have given us over which we are stewards, that we will we'll use these things, our money, our time, our, our love, our wisdom, that we will use these things to the benefit of those around us. Father, we pray that we would watch our, our words, our attitudes, that we complain less, that we worry less, Father, that we attempt to live in a way that will please you and be a blessing to those who surround us. We pray, Father, for those who we would like to keep in mind, those that are close to us, those that are family to us, those that might be church family and those that might be physical family. We pray for all of those who are struggling physically, those who are struggling with their bodies, those who are struggling through trial and, and hardship. Father, we pray that you would, would be with David Hamrick as he has been released from the hospital from his COVID pneumonia, but we know, Father, he still has that cancer diagnosis we know that he still has a, uh, a struggle in front of him. We pray that you would be with the Arches. We pray that you would be with Donna Hines' niece and the, the difficulty she's having from her cancer treatments. We pray that you would be with uh, those who have had recent health struggles and who, who are continuing to go to the doctor uh, in the future for issues they may have and issues they need cleared up. We pray that, that you would be with Adam Zach. We pray that you would be with... Uh, Brenda's husband, we pray, Father, that you would be with those who uh, who might be on our minds, but we, for some reason, have, have left out of prayers. You know who they are. You know who is struggling. We pray that you would be with them. Father, we pray that you would be with those today who are struggling emotionally and mentally and perhaps even spiritually. We pray that you would be with the family of Angela Thomas, Father, that they would be increased in faith, that they would would be able to to overcome their grief, Father, and not that the devil would use it as an opportunity to to put some distance between you and them. We pray you would give them comfort. We pray 
you would give them peace. Father, I pray that you would be with those of our number who are struggling spiritually, who are struggling with their, their dedication, who are struggling with their priorities. They, they will understand, Father, the, the benefit, the blessing, the glory, and the hope that is in living the Christian life and that something may be said or done by us or some outside source, Father, that could point them back in the right direction and hopefully would affect their hearts and minds in some way so that they will be interested in being obedient to you again. We thank you, Father, for those who have made the decision to obey the gospel and to live their lives in a way that pleases you soon. We pray that that you would be with those who have, have had studies or may have studies ongoing or studies in the near future, Father, that they would be open to listening to that truth, to accepting that truth, to accepting the opportunity that you have given them, Father, of eternal life. It is that eternal life, Father, that you have offered each and every one of us that we are, are working for and striving for. We pray that we would live in a way, Father, that will will secure that future for us. We pray that that you will forgive us for our sins, that we will be mindful of your Son and the sacrifice that he's given for us, that we will understand what has been done on our behalf and we will live in a way, Father, knowing that we cannot repay you or we cannot repay Jesus for what's been done, but living in a way that proves, Father, that, that we appreciate it and that we are going to live our lives for him the best we can, having given our lives over to you. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for his sacrifice, Father. And it's in your Son, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen. I'm going to turn this back on, and we're going to see if it continues to crackle. I don't know what that was. If you haven't already done so, let's take our Bibles and open to the book of Isaiah and turn to chapter number 5. Chapter 5 has been termed the Song of the Vineyard. We talked about the importance of a vineyard last week, the, the role that it played in the lives of those who lived in the, the ancient Near East, that they are a symbol of prosperity and blessing for the inhabitants of the land. Isaiah used these symbols in a parable to teach a vital lesson concerning their relationship with God. He returns to the image of a vineyard to describe the deliverance of Israel in chapter 27. And as we mentioned last week in a variety of passages, Jesus used the same imagery to instruct his disciples. Matthew chapter 20, chapter 21, Mark chapter 12, Luke chapter 20, and perhaps the one we know the best about the vineyard is in John chapter 15. The first section that we went through last week was verses 1 through 6. A quick recap for those who were not here. The word beloved or well-beloved that's there in verse 1 of chapter 5 are from the same Hebrew root word. Forms of the word are used 40 times in the book of Song of Solomon, and they are used to express intimate relations. Throughout the entirety of the Bible, the relationship that is frequently used to describe what God intends for us and desires for us is a covenant relationship of a sort of marriage. When you look at the language that was used in the Old Testament, when the people decided to chase other gods, G gods, who were not actually gods, how did the Old Testament describe what they did? Sorry? Okay, it's false idols. What did you say, Brendan? Adulterous. Adulterous. Anybody else? We don't generally use language like this in common everyday vernacular, but the, the old King James Version, uh, I believe that's where it is, accused them of going a whoring. It, it spoke of it as it were an adulterous type of relationship. It was that which was a, a spiritual form of adultery. God had brought them close. He had provided for them. He had protected them. He had promised them a great future. And at some point, they had grown disillusioned with him. They had grown distracted. They decided for whatever reason, and a variety of different reasons, that they would chase after these, these other gods. When you go all the way back 
to chapters like Exodus chapter 20, what were they told and what did they know should have been preached from generation to generation? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But then you've got these, these false idols. How quickly did that enter into the consciousness of the Israelite people, of the Hebrew people? Even within the days of what we refer to as an incredibly faithful leader in the days of Moses. Moses ascends Mount Sinai to talk to God and what do the people do? They go to Aaron and say, we don't know what's happening with Moses. We don't know if he's even coming back. So why don't you make us gods? And Aaron makes this calf. And what was the proclamation they were told? This is the God that brought you out of. And it was something that they struggled with for, for generation after generation. It had been said before, perhaps it's trite, but there's certainly some accuracy to it. It's been said before that you could get the Israelites out of Egypt, but you couldn't get Egypt out of the Israelites. And you could understand that from their perspective in that they are frail as it relates to humans. And that's what they had known. They did not have this long association with God. When Moses came to them and said, I am the God of your, I am the God of your fathers has sent me, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. They had an, an, an acknowledgement, a consciousness of God, but what had they lived? They had lived with this, this, this Egyptian form of, of mythology and, and idol worship and sacrificing to, to gods, and some of them for the entirety uh, of their existence. All of them for the entirety of their existence, as long as they had, had been there. And what the Old Testament tells us is that even though God continued to come down to them and express himself to them, generation after generation after generation continued to do it. Even when strong leaders were in place, after Joshua and the elders that served under him had passed away, what does Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 say? There arose a generation that knew not God. Well, they knew idols, but they didn't know Jehovah God. They didn't know the Lord God. And this is a constant struggle. Well, this isn't something that is relegated to only the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul talks about a, a marriage, a, a betrothal. Between who? Between those who were non-Christians at the time and between Christ. And then when we look at the language of Revelation chapter 21, how is that city that John sees described in Revelation 21? As a bride adorned for her husband. We've got this relationship that exists. I want to mention a scripture to you very quickly. Over in the book of James, if I can get my fingers to work quickly. Over in the book of James, writing to those who were already Christians. In chapter 4, he says, You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses. Now, he's not accusing them of being physically adulterers or adulteresses. He's not accusing them of leaving their spouses and engaging in illicit sexual activities. He says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so you see, again, that, that language of defying and breaking that covenant relationship uh, is used. These are just a, a small selection of verses that we could use in accordance with, Hebrew, with, with Isaiah 5 and 1 when you look at this well-beloved. It's very clear in the Bible that God desires a pure, constant, and consistent relationship uh, with his people. As we looked last week, what did God do with this vineyard? What was he doing? He prepared it, right? He says he dug it up, cleared out his stones, planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in the midst, made a wine press in it. For those who were here last week, what was the importance of this tower and what was the importance of the wine press? The tower indicates protection. Right? The tower indicates that somebody is able to, to survey the land around, to know when a threat is coming, to be able to provide for and to protect for that vineyard. What was indicated by the wine press? Prosperity. Prosperity. Okay, what else? What's indicated by the wine press? As you're preparing the vineyard, 
Not a crop has moved yet, but you've prepared this vat, this wine press. Why? You are expecting this great produce. So it is something you're putting into plan where you are expecting something good to grow. So he expected it, it says in verse 2, to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. And then he asks them in verse 3 for them to judge. So he gives them this situation. He asks for them to judge the situation. And if they were to answer in a, a condescending sort of way toward this vineyard, who would they actually be judging? themselves right we, we talked about the the similarity that exists between this uh, and in what is it second samuel chapter 12 whenever nathan goes to david we mentioned that last sunday we mentioned that nathan goes to david and tells him the story about these two men one who had a lot of lambs one who only had one the one who had a lot instead of taking one of his for a traveler took one of the others how did david respond when he was told that story that man's guilty of death. And then we have those, those so uh, well-known words, thou art the man. Well, that's what these people were doing. God was asking them to judge themselves. He says in verse 4, What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild? So he asks the question, and then in verses 5 and 6 gives the pronouncement. And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned. What's, what's indicated there? If power indicates protection, what does taking away a hedge and it shall be burned indicate? Protection is being removed and God is allowing something to happen. We'll see what that is later on in this chapter. And break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. Again, a removal of defenses. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. What's the imagery there? Where do briars and thorns generally show up? When it's neglected, okay? Why would it be neglected? There's nobody to take care of it because nobody lives there anymore. There's nobody to inhabit it anymore. And when nobody inhabits it, what does it turn into? Well, if we were talking about the Old West, we would say it turned into a ghost town, right? There's, there, there's nobody there. There's nobody to live in it. Nobody to treat it. It will not be pruned or dug. God has already attempted to prune, but they aren't listening. They don't want to listen to what his prophets have to say. So they'll be dug up and God will start again. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. Now, yet through all of these things, Isaiah still mentions hope. Brown, do we believe that God would have decided to God had begged for them to return. Jeremiah. But what does God know? God knows they're not going to. God knows that regardless of how. How they would respond to them? Well, in Matthew 23, 37, how did Jesus say that the Jewish people responded to those God sent? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who killest the prophets and stonest them which I have sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children to me as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. They weren't willing in Jesus' day, and they weren't willing in this day. I've mentioned this verse a handful of times, and even though they're not contemporaries, they are very closely related to the other. I continue to want to mention and put into your minds Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Stand in the way and see and ask for the good paths, where is the good way? You will find rest for your souls. What's the last phrase of Jeremiah 6, 16? But they would not they're just not interested okay verse seven for the vineyard of the lord if there were any doubts is the house of israel and the men of judah are his pleasant plant he looked for justice but behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry for help i know we've got at least a few in here that weren't here last sunday morning so for those that were here we ended at verse 7. What could we discuss when it says God looked for justice but found oppression, looked for righteousness but found a cry for help? If God were to look down on a congregation today, people who have obeyed the truth, who have been added to the body of Christ, what would he expect to see 
in the lives of those members? How would he expect them to treat one another? Anybody? Okay, with compassion, respect. Okay, anything else? Love, what else? A great, sorry? Kindness. Kindness, anything else? I mean, we, we got a lot of, you got a lot of New Testament words we can reach for. There's not one right answer. It's all good. Anything else? Honesty. Honesty, okay. Encouraging. Edification. Sacrifice. Care. Hospitality. Benevolence. On and on and on we could go. What would happen if God were to look down in a local congregation and he sees people holding grudges? Dividing up into groups, talking about each other behind their backs, the rich taking advantage of the poor, the white taking advantage of the black, and everybody arguing together. Would that, would that be a, a family that God looks down and expects to see of his people? Of course not. And he would be angry, and justifiably so, if that's what he were to look down and see. Well, what does heaven indicate God sees in his people? They should be caring for each other, but they're actually taking advantage of each other. They should be loving but the rich are taking advantage of the poor. The leaders are taking advantage uh, of the, the common people. Those who are well are taking advantage uh, of the sick. This is the mentality that we look for. He looks for justice, but behold oppression. When we're looking at the way that God's people were interacting with each other, if we think about the danger of a bribe, what was the danger of a bribe? That it removes justice. That's not something that we speak of in great detail very frequently when we look at the Bible. But God certainly has uh, this, this very uh, grand idea of, uh, of justice, of, of those being treated in a way uh, that is commensurate with how God would treat us and how we would want ourselves to be treated. Jesus mentioned that, right? Right. Right around the time in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, ask and seek and knock, what else did he say? As you would want others to treat you, so you do to them. Well, that's not what was happening here. God's people were devouring each other. God's people were destroying each other. Is this something that can happen today or was this only an indication of problems that God's people had then? Anybody? Anybody? Why could that happen outside of the Old Testament times? How, how could something like this, of this, this hatred or this bitterness or this, uh, this disregard and neglect of some of God's people for other of God's people, how could that happen then and how is it still possible to happen now? What creates this problem? What's the first and what creates this problem? When God is not the priority, sin. you're always going to run into this problem, right? Sin is always a problem. Sin is always at the door. Sin is always waiting. And if at any point we open that door and allow it, uh, it will always come in. Anybody else? What kind of things open the door for this opportunity? No faith, self-centeredness, on and on we could go. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I'm going to use... Uh, I'm going to use a little bit of a, a silly reference, I guess. And if you don't watch uh, this sport, I guess it might not make any sense to you uh, at all. Uh, my, my family and I, when it's that season, uh, enjoy watching NASCAR. You know, that, that's funny to some people. It's not a, not a fun sport for a lot of people. Uh, I, I, uh, if, if I had that conversation with my dad, he, he, it's not something that uh, he understands or has any indication of uh, inclination to watch uh, because as far as he's concerned it's just you know you just keep going left it's just people just constantly making left-hand turns now while that's not true and if you have a fight about that we can do that later there's something that comes to mind when I think about that there are some places where 
there are more wrecks than others. And there's a line that is used frequently, a phrase that is uttered by some of these commentaries uh, that cautions breed cautions. When you have, have one wreck, sometimes you just have a lot more pile up after it. Well, the same type of attitude exists as it relates to problems among Christians. Grudges and fights and wars in the church, these things just breed more. They're not going to in some way clean out and just magically get better one day. The more negative feelings that exist, the more crashes in between each other we have, they're just going to create uh, more problems. The problem is only going to, to get deeper. Why? Because we're not centered on God. It all goes back to that. Now, there's a variety of other reasons why uh, these things can take place. But we're not centered on God. Look at the next section. Verses 8 to 23 is the next grand section. We're going to read verses 8 to 10. Somebody want to read that for us? Isaiah 5, 8 to 10, and then we'll discuss it. Shall be many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yet ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of the homer shall be. Okay. Now, some of that makes sense to us, and some of it doesn't. Even after we get finished this morning, some of it may still not, because it is not a of measurement, a set of measurements that that you and I are familiar with. Be that as it may, we're going to go ahead and discuss this a little bit. I'm going to give you some details so that hopefully verse 10 makes more sense. We look at woes to these covetous people in verses 8 through 10. The first woe that is pronounced is on those who add house to house and field to field. What would be the appropriate way of obtaining land that you want? You could buy it, okay. What are some other ways? Sorry? Steal. Steal. What else? Inherited. Okay. Inherit. Anything else? When you think about people who get lands in an unjust way, what Old Testament people come to mind? Does anybody think about Ahab? Anybody think about Jezebel? Anybody think about poor Naboth? He's got this vineyard. Ahab says, I want this vineyard. This is, this is my vineyard. I don't, I don't want to sell it. I don't want anything to happen to it. So Ahab, this, this, this grand, uh, glorious king who's intelligent, who's uh, wise, who is patient. None of that's true, by the way. He, what does he do? Does he figure out a way to, to discuss this with Naboth and maybe offer him more? And he, he gets an offer that he just can't turn down. Now he runs and he falls in the lap of his wife. He cries like a baby and he says, Naboth won't give me the field. I don't know what to do, mama. That's how Ahab reacts when he goes to Jezebel. So what does Jezebel do for him? She says, don't worry, I'll fix it. Who was really king back then? It'd be hard, it'd be hard to say that Ahab was king. You know, it, it certainly looks like Jezebel was king. What does she do? She says, Ahab, you don't worry about it. She goes out, she has it killed, and she just gives Ahab what he wants. Well, there was a right way and a wrong way to go about land. And we're not going to take the time uh, to read through it all this morning because we won't get through uh, chapter 5. But there were some, some interesting laws that God had established that guaranteed certain lands stayed with certain people. Now, we don't really think about it too much because we don't really spend a lot of time studying this, and it's not something that you and I uh, deal with today. Uh, but how much thought have we put into, and how, how, what's the last time that you studied anything about the year of Jubilee? Has it been a while? Has it been a minute? Every 50th year, every 50th year, what was to happen? Anybody remember? They gave the land back. That you, God made this law, established this law to ensure that these lands stayed with particular families. What I think was fascinating is that the price that you would get for land, if, if for some reason you needed to sell this land, the price you would get for the land varied. It varied based on what? Does anybody know? 
It didn't vary based on how important you were. It didn't vary based on how, how great the land was. The large variation was how far away you were from the year of Jubilee. If you, sold it 40, if you sold it 45 years before the year of Jubilee, you're going to have a good bit more than if you sold it five years before Jubilee. Because at the year of Jubilee, it reverts back. It was essentially a long-term lease. Uh, this is the better way to discuss it. It wasn't necessarily a, a sale of sorts. And if you'd like to write down some scriptures, go ahead and write these down and read them later. Uh, as I said, we, we aren't going to take the time to read them this morning because our time is short, but it's in Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. I'm going to give you a set of verses so you can go and read about this later. Verses 1 to 7, verses 8 to 17, and verses 23 and 24. It is certainly an indication, at least perhaps it is an indication, that this law was being ignored in the days of Isaiah. Micah and Amos also warned the people of their sin of covetousness in land grabbing. Uh, write down, if you would, Micah chapter 2, verses 2 to 9. Micah chapter 2, verses 2 to 9. And I want to also read this one for you. Amos chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. And pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defy my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. I'm going to go one verse further into verse 9. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Amos is giving further indication of the way that they would take advantage of their own kin, take advantage of their own families. As we go into verse 9 back in Isaiah 5, in my hearing the Lord of hosts said, what does this phrase indicate? That the message is not coming from Isaiah. Now that is continuously important for us to remember because the message Isaiah is speaking is not the message of a preacher who is surveying the tone and tenor of his country and telling the congregation the way things are likely going to happen. What is Isaiah doing? Isaiah is at this point a mouthpiece for God. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's what's taking place here. So what Isaiah has to say should be accepted and should be appreciated by these people, especially when he pronounces their future. Truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. Does it matter how much your house costs? Does it matter how good you have it adorned? Does it matter how, how greatly manicured the lawn and the hedges are and how large the garage is and how many things you have filling the garage if you no longer live there? doesn't do you a lot of good, right? It's still going to get grown over. It's still going to deteriorate when somebody's not there to maintain it. So they want to add house to house and field to field. They are covetous. They want to give themselves more things. And what does God tell them? Not only are you not going to have the more things you want, I'm going to take away the things that you do have. Verse 10. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. That might not mean much to us because we, we don't really think about things in uh, that measurement. The land was going to be cursed by God. It was going to lose its productivity as a consequence of the people's sin. What verse 10 tells us is the farmers were not going to be recovering the amount of seed that they had planted. Okay, 10 acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. A bath is seven and a half gallons. Uh, if I have, if I remember uh, this correctly, the bath is the liquid measure and the ephah is the dry measure. So bath is seven and a half gallons. The average yield for 10 acres would be 500 baths. 
So the amount of liquid you should have from 10 acres of vineyard is 500 baths. And yet God says 10 acres is going to yield how many? Instead of 500 baths, you get one. Now, if somebody wants to go do the math on that, you can, you're, you're, you're more than free to do that if you want to. Seven and a half gallons by 500. Anybody do that off the top of your head? Anybody want to pull out your phones and cheat? <laughs> Anybody ever have a school teacher tell you years ago you needed to learn calculation, multiplication, division, because you weren't always going to have a calculator with you? They didn't know, they didn't know anything about the smartphone coming, did they? You can pull out that calculator and you can do it right then and there. All right. What's that? 35,000. Okay. So 35,000 gallons. And yet all they're going to get is seven and a half. That's a large, 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 extraordinary difference, isn't it? One homer of seed shall yield one ephah. A homer is a measure of grain, equals about eight bushels or 32 pecks. An ephah is a dry measure or three pecks. An ephah, Ezekiel 45, 11, and Ruth 2, 17, if you want to write those down for reference. An ephah is one-tenth of a homer. So essentially what's happening here when you look at the end of verse 10 is they're only retrieving, recovering one-tenth of what they should be expecting. I was reading through... Uh, ways to to understand what's happening here in verse 10 and one of the things i read across was they were it could be said that they were barely recovering if that they were recovering just what they sowed there certainly wasn't any uh, productivity so what's the indication from this even though we don't use these kind of measurements just looking at a little bit of indication from this what's god telling them you can work you can toil you can sweat you can put your life into this vineyard it's not going to go anywhere. Everything around you is going to dry up. Everything around you is going to, to shrivel up. <clears throat> I'm trying very hard not to sneeze right now. <clears throat> the next section, verses 11 to 17. Woe to a debauching people. We've got about five minutes left. Let's look through this section. So I'm going to go ahead and read this, verses 11 to 17. You can divide it up if you like. Somebody want to read 14 to 17? Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their um, palm. And he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean, mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled. Through seventeen. Then shall uh, the land speed after their man, and the woods of which shall stranger eat. Okay. Verses 11 and 12, the pursuit of pleasure had become the goal of the wealthy in Israel. They had no time or energy for God's service. If you'd like to write down a couple of scriptures, write down Proverbs 23, 31 and Ephesians 5 and 18. Woe those who rise early in the morning that they may follow. Another word that we use there is pursue intoxicating drink. Who continue until night till wine inflames them. What kind of lifestyle? I want to add to this, not only do you see woe pronounced on this type of people who are taking such drink within themselves, but the Old Testament also gives an indication of God's judgment upon a person that also offers that and pushes that upon somebody else. Habakkuk chapter 2, 
uh, and verse 15 and 16, if you want to write that down uh, in your notes. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and flute and wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of his hands. What kind of people are in verses 11 and 12? All of us probably have heard the phrase, have your cake and eat it too, right? So what does it mean? Certainly you wouldn't use a phrase without knowing what it means, right? What does have your cake and eat it too mean? Nobody. That's one of those phrases, isn't it, that we know what it means, but it's hard to put into words. (laughs) Have your cake and eat it too means you have all the desires that you want and no work to be expended. They wanted God's protection. They wanted God's providence. They wanted God's love. They wanted God's promises, but they didn't want to do anything to please God. They weren't concerned about what was important to God. They were concerned about what was important to them. They were consumed by what? Self-centeredness. Brenda, you mentioned being self-centered, self-absorbed earlier on. They have wine. They have music. It seems as if they have great promises and, and, and fun parties. But what? Why does the Old Testament tell us we shouldn't go after the way of the wicked? It may sound and look like it's real good for a while. If you ever see any commercials, by the way, have, have you ever seen a, an alcohol commercial that's sad? Why not? Because everybody knows alcohol makes you happy. Everybody knows alcohol is great in your life. Everybody knows that alcohol always livens up a party. Anytime you see these ads, especially for these new uh, seltzers that you find, everybody's having fun. There's music. Everybody's dancing. Everybody's happy. What do they not show you in those commercials? They don't show you the broken home. They don't show you the the problems that come with your health. They don't show you the the crumpled up minivan because somebody decided they weren't too buzzed to drive and get in and, and take away somebody's life. They don't show you all the bad things that happen. And the broken house. Right. So what does the Bible tell us? Why should we not go after the wicked? What should we do with the wicked? Consider their end. These people weren't concerned about their end. They weren't concerned about where they were going. They weren't concerned about what was coming next. They were concerned about getting the most they could out of the moment. And they didn't care whether God was in that moment. These were God's people. These were his chosen people. That he's supposed to be leading into this promised land. Providing them with this promised land and what have they done with it? They got the land So they don't need God anymore All right, we'll come back in God willing next week and we'll start in verse 13 as we continue that section
Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Colleen Church of Christ. We're very thankful to have everyone here worshiping with us and very thankful for our guests. Um, if you have the, the ability, please, in front of you, there should be a card. You can fill that out and leave it in the queue and also give us the opportunity to greet, greet you after service. Um, if you are watching online, please hit the like button on Facebook so that we know you are there. And if you have a cell phone or other noise-making device, please ensure that it's on silent or off so that you do not disturb the service. If you have need of a nursery or training room, if you go towards the back of the auditorium, one of the ushers will help you find either one that you need. For our sick list... Um, Sister Barbara Robinson is in Seton Hospital recovering from emergency surgery. Martha Chafin is recovering from a fall that left her with three fractures. She's now in the Colleen Nursing and Re Rehabilitation, and she's requesting prayers. Uh, Brother Adam Zach will be undergoing more health tests soon. Brother Jim Dukes is recovering from a blood pressure issue. Ken Sellers had an aortic ulcer and has a follow-up appointment with his doctor on February 4th and a consult to see a vascular doctor in San Antonio. So please keep him and the sellers in your prayers. Donna Hines' son, Jared, had to go to the ER and receive IV antibiotics, steroids, and fluids because he was dehydrated due to pain and swelling in his throat. Josephine Spears' friend, Iris, was diagnosed with cancer, and she's asking for prayers for her. Uh, Caitlin Bowles and her husband, Bryson, are recovering from covid also, Amelia would like prayers for her and her family. In sad news, we do wish to extend the sympathy and prayers of the family of Sister Angela Thomas, who passed away on Friday morning. Service arrangements have not yet been made. We also wish to extend our sympathy and prayers to Creta Bales and her family in the loss of her cousin and former member, Sydney Earl Young. A memorial service was held yesterday in Burnett. Please keep them in prayers as well. Members of our military, uh, Brother Michael Rogers is in ALC school in Georgia, and his wife Jessica has been deployed to Kuwait. Tracy Wilson's son, Zane Wilson, is in Warrant Officer Cadet School in Fort Rucker, Alabama. And Brother Derek Cole had to travel to Ohio to train soldiers. He'll be away until February 24th. So please keep these members and their loved ones in your prayers. Some other announcements, uh, the ladies of the congregation are collecting new socks and gloves for homeless shelters through Saturday, February 12th. Please place them in the box in the foyer. We also have a pantry drive. The Benevolence Pantry is in need of the following items. Canned vegetables, canned fruits, canned meats, pasta sauces, beans, both canned and dry, cereals, soups, ramen noodles, and paper towels. Please place these items in the pantry box located in the foyer. And for the ladies, there will be a bridal shower honoring Beverly Williams' daughter, Robin, on February 5th at 2 p.m. at the Gabriel, Gabriel Oaks Church of Christ. The invitation is posted on the ladies' bulletin board. I have a card from the Wilsons, and it reads... Dear Christian family, thank you for all the cards of kindness in our time of sorrow and the loss of our nephew. It means a lot to us knowing so many are thinking of us during this time. In Christian love, Al and Gail Wilson. We will have one more announcement by Brother Fisher, but those to serve today, our song leader will be Brother Paul Portley. Our first prayer will be by Brother Daryl Higginbotham. Our scripture reading will be by Brother Kingsford. Our sermon will be by Brother Phil McIntosh. Communion will be by Brother Roger and Reggie. And our closing prayer will be by Brother Gianni. Good morning. As um, Brother Galen mentioned, we're thankful for everyone who's in attendance at this time, especially those who are visiting with us. 
I want to make uh, one brief announcement. Um, normally, we like to take time each year to honor our widows and widowers. Due to uh, COVID and other life circumstances, we was not able to have our widow's banquet this year. So what the elders would like to do uh, is after worship service, we ask that the widows and widowers that's in the audience today, please come forward and on the front few pews. Brother Zach and I would like to have, say a few words to you. And uh, we will pause the service at the end of worship service, allow those who have to leave to leave. But we also ask that if all of the members, if you also will be able to stay as well. Thank you. Our first selection this morning is not in the book, so you'll have to follow along on the overhead. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes, home where the Bible is loved and taught, home where the Master will will all, home crowned in beauty the love and raw. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Home where the Father is true and strong. Home that are free from the blight of wrong. Home that are joyous with love and strong. Oh, give us Christian home. God, give us Christian home. God, give us Christian homes. Home where the Mother is Queen. Where strive to show others thy way is best. Home where the Lord is honored, care. God give us Christian home. God give us Christian home. God give us Christian home. Home where the children are led to know. Rising with beauty, with love and soul. Home where the altar fires burn and glow. God give us Christian home. God give us Christian Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now with heavy hearts. Brother Phil has brought to our attention in his bulletin this week about our manifesting our emotions through crying. There's going to be a lot of crying this week. There was a lot of crying last week. We have brought lost brothers and sisters, people that we've known for a long, long time. We ask that you be with us as we go through this period. Brother Sidney Earl and Angela Thomas, as they are with you and will be with you. Be with us as we go through this period of mourning, that we remember them and how they affected our lives. This period of crying, as pointed out by Brother Phil, is something that comes over us. It's something that those that were looking upon the cross where Jesus was, they too cried because of the life 
that was being sacrificed for us. We ask that you be with us during this service today, that it will be pleasing to you, that we will remember the things you've done for us, that you will, we, that we will remember the, that when we see Jesus, he was you in the form of Jesus, in the type of life that he led as an example for us. We ask that you be with all of us through this period again. We ask that you be with us as we partake of the fruit of the vine and the bread, the remembrance of Jesus, and the life that he lived for us, and the sacrifice he made for us. Thankful for again for everything you've done for us. Bless us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading for this morning service is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 10 to 13. And then Romans, chapter 13, verse 7. Romans, chapter 12, verse 10 to 13. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in prayer, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distribution to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. Romans chapter 13, verse seven. Render therefore to all their dues, Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Number sixty from um, number six hundred and eighty one, six eighty one. Let's stand together. It's a song about family. Let's stand together. And if you want to hold hands of the one next to you, you can do that too. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family where love no no end. Oh, Jesus has saved. Sometimes we cry, sometimes we cry. 
Every year, the citizens of this country have the opportunity, if they so choose, to remember those who have given themselves, who have given of their time, of their energy, of their sweat, of their blood, and for some even more, as they serve for their country. Perhaps some remember them on more than one day, but at least one day out of the year is a day to honor those who have given of themselves, to honor those who have been wounded in the service of our country, wounded physically or wounded mentally or emotionally. Some of us have no idea the strength, the courage, the determination that is necessary for one to sacrifice of themselves to join in that cause of fighting for and defending for our country. Some of us can only imagine what those who have served in the military may have seen, especially those who have witnessed war, the effects of war, and maybe have gained some injury as a result of war and battle. They generally receive our respect, our care, our thoughts, our admiration. For too many, though, perhaps it's only one day out of the year. What about all of the other days? It is a sad development of a forgotten wounded soldier in our country who does no longer pass through the consciousness of those around them. And we're not talking about those who are forgotten because they were missing in action or killed in action. We're talking about those who were forgotten who live among us. Though they carry within themselves injuries, they carry within themselves damages, and they struggle to fit into life around us. They may have challenges reacclimating to civilian life. They may have limited job opportunities. They may carry with them some physical remnant of what they have endured in war or in battle and service. They may carry with them an injury that cannot be seen from the outside. And they walk among us forgotten and too often overlooked. Our thoughts, our cares, our prayers should go out to those who have 
served, who have given of themselves, and who are so often forgotten, though they live among us. As we go through our lesson this morning, I want you to transition from that type of wounded soldier to a slightly different one. One who has suffered, not necessarily in the same way, but one who has suffered nonetheless. One who has experienced loss nonetheless, and likewise walks among us too often overlooked or forgotten. Forgotten not because they're not loved, but forgotten because their wounds aren't necessarily visible. Just as those who are veterans of military service don't always wear some kind of indication that they served and that they are veterans, those who are wounded soldiers of the Lord's army and kingdom, likewise, don't always carry about the evidences that prove the wounds that they have incurred. And they may walk and live amongst the church, no one understanding what they've given, what they've lost, what they've endured. These men and women are not forgotten or overlooked because they aren't loved, but because time marches on. And the wounds and the injuries that they have incurred simply over time mean less to those around them. Oh, they care perhaps a great deal when someone loses a husband or a wife. But before long, they go back to their own lives. They've got their own families and jobs and responsibilities. They've got their own distractions in life. And those who have lost a husband or a wife are then left oftentimes by themselves to pick up pieces and to reformulate a new life. Living amongst those who are physically and emotionally and mentally perhaps more healthy and energized. Not understanding The injury that has taken place to their loved ones. As those who are widows and widowers among us this morning. We realize that you live and work and love among us. And oftentimes many of us do not appreciate nor do we remember very frequently. That the whole you once were established by God. Created by God. Unified by God. Has become a part. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 says, Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called a woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they should become one flesh. What our Lord said for us in Matthew chapter 19, after they have become one flesh, what God had joined together, let not man separate. It is a holy union, a godly union. But as some of us in our number realize perhaps more perfectly than any of the rest of us, it is also too temporary. It is our purpose this morning, as Brother Fisher mentioned, to remember, to honor, To extend a portion of ourselves and our affection to those of you who are in our attendance this morning who have lost a spouse, a beloved husband or wife. To show you that you are in our thoughts, you are in our prayers. To show you some honor this morning. I want to discuss as we begin the primary body of our lesson this morning. I want to start talking about our lives and how they play out. The topic for our first point this morning is lightning in a bottle. If you'd like to take notes, I'm going to continue to tell you. Oh, this is a slightly different lesson than normal. I'm still going to tell you the the points as we go throughout this lesson if you'd like to take notes. Lightning in a bottle. Many of us understand what lightning looks like. We understand how it works and how it operates in this world, at least how we relate to it in our eyes. The Bible speaks of lightning. Jesus mentioned lightning recorded for us in Luke chapter 17 and verse 24. As he says, the son of man in his day will be as lightning that flashes from one part under the heavens to the other. All of us have seen, have witnessed, maybe even have felt the the rumble of that thunder. We've heard the crack and the pop of lightning and, and we've seen it happen. 
In an instant, it's as bright as the eyes can stand and then gone again. The Bible tells us that our lives are sort of like that. In James chapter 4 and verse 14, we're told that our lives are but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. The Bible speaks of our lives as a vapor or a mist. I want you to imagine in your eyes, mind, the tea kettle that's being heated up on the stovetop. How that when it finally reaches that tipping point, that it erupts out of that tea kettle with a great amount of force, announcing its presence with a great noise. And yet as quickly as it arrives, it evaporates. The Bible tells us that our lives are like that. The scriptures teach us about the beauty that exists in life, the fragility that exists in life, the cycle that exists in life. Perhaps none so completely, though, as our first reading this morning. Take your Bibles, if you'd like to follow along with me, and open to the book of Ecclesiastes. Read along with me. Verses 1 through 8. If you would follow along. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. The scripture tells us in a variety of places of the beauty that exists in life. Two of them are housed within the confines of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and in chapter 12. And it speaks to us about the life cycles that exist in our world. Now, perhaps when the song comes on the radio by the birds, released in 1965, the song Turn, 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 perhaps you can sing along with that song when you hear it come on. Perhaps you are very familiar with the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Perhaps you have even spent the time to memorize these first eight verses. You may understand what the scripture has to say and what Ecclesiastes is attempting to teach a receptive mind. But no one truly understands down deep in their bones what the writer of Ecclesiastes is attempting to teach like those who have lost a loved one. Those of you who are gathered here this morning who are widows or widowers, you are in the unenviable position of having learned separation to a depth most of us have not. Many of us may have lost parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, or dear friends. But most of us here this morning have not lost spouses. We have now witnessed love in its entirety from dawn to dusk. I don't know what it would be like. And I don't anticipate the day in which I might wake up and be a father only and no longer a husband. And yet you carry around with you these wounds These injuries of having been separated from someone so close to you. Having learned a lesson that most of us will never learn until life forces that lesson upon us. Those who have lost a spouse are tasked with the future of learning a new life, which is if you're taking notes, is our second point. Learning a new life because the life which you had anticipated has been altered for you. Not by choice, not by your design, but by simply the matter of life. 
When a young couple stands before the minister and exchanges their vows, they dream about the life that is to come. All of the conversations that have not yet been had, all of the trips and the vacations that have not yet been traveled, all of the opportunities that have not yet been grasped, perhaps they dream of 10, 30, 50, or 75 years together. Those who have dedicated themselves to a life where they sacrifice and love for one another and mean what they say when they make those vows and they say, tell death do us part, and they mean that in a life, in a country, in a day, and in an age when those vows seem to mean very little to so many. It's commendable. They may have great plans and it may last a little while or it may last a great while. But at some point, the till death do us part clause of their vows actuates. And they're left essentially picking up the pieces of a life once designed for them. They must dig deeper into their reserves of strength, of courage, and determination to remake their lives because their identity has changed. How they view themselves, how they live, how others view them has been altered. And as we mentioned this morning, oftentimes they may endure such pain around others for a while, but inevitably too quickly and too often on their own. Those who seek to pick up the pieces... Those who are attempting to remake their daily life have a great challenge in front of them that most of us simply cannot sympathize with. It's not as if we don't want to. We attempt to give our empathy, which is feeling for someone, but it's, it's difficult to feel sympathy because we've never understood what that feeling means. We cannot understand what that feeling means. Those of us who have not endured such loss. We need to ensure that we are offering of ourselves to widows and widowers around us. Our love, our time, our gifts, our sacrifice, our appreciation. And if there is something of ourselves we could offer, we offer it too. We need to ensure to offer a piece of ourselves to those who are suffering. They say time heals all wounds. But certain things, time alone won't heal. And in the case of one who has lost a spouse, time itself may even seem as if it's an enemy. Because time doesn't seem to move at the same rate as it does for others. For those who are surrounding them, they love them. There is an outpouring of love and care and compassion. But over time, those individuals go back to their own lives. Those of us who have not yet learned such loss must task ourselves with more frequently keeping within our focus and as recipients of our compassion, those around us who are widows and widowers and continue to offer ourselves to them long after the casseroles, the cards and the flowers are gone. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26, if one member suffers, all of the members suffer with it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 15 says to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. As for those who are in that unenviable position. As you're attempting now to remake life. Some of you may be very recent widows or widowers. Some may have made a new life for quite a many years now. There are doors that are closed and doors that are opened in a variety of aspects of life that we may live. But I want to mention to you very quickly that a new day has dawned. God is still your God and you still have love to give. You still have value. You still have purpose. And you are not forgotten. As we think about the doors of opportunity that may lay 
waiting to be pushed open by those who have incurred such loss. I want us to read through the scriptures about how one person dealt with such a change in their life. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ruth and open to chapter number one. We see as we began reading a young woman who had a variety of changes in her life, changes that were wildly variable, unexpected. A woman who was an alien to the Hebrew people had a family of Hebrews move into her area and into her nation, married into this Hebrew family. Who knows what opportunities she may have been dreaming of in the future. And yet, just as that life began to get rolling, that life was changed instantly and permanently. I want you to read with me a couple of verses this morning as to how Ruth dealt with this change In her life. Beginning in verse 8. Ruth chapter 1. Reads. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law. Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you. As you have dealt with the dead. And with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest. Each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them. And they lifted up their voices. And wept. And they said to her. Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God, where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Verse 18 tells us that Naomi witnessed Ruth's determination. Ruth's life had turned upside down. And yet she still had an enormous amount of love, care, concern and compassion to give. Though her life changed, what Ruth did was to reach into the reserves of love and care that she possessed. And she found new places and new ways to use her love. New places and new ways to use her compassion. New places and new ways to use her concern. And became one who was enormously valuable to many around her. Of all the doors that might close when you lose a loved one, as it pertains to the work of the Lord and to your place in the kingdom, one of the doors that is opened is a door of godly service. We read in the Bible in Luke chapter 2, an example of a widow named Anna who had been a widow for quite some many years. And she spent all of her time in the temple and even went out and spoke to others about the Lord. We find the opportunity and the expectation and the approval of one who is a a widow in God's eyes in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 5, who trusts in the Lord and engages in prayers and supplications night and day. There are opportunities that are afforded. Though life may bring changes, though struggles and difficulties may present themselves in your courage, your strength, your determination, and your sacrifice for God, you must realize you still have a place 
in the kingdom of God, in the vineyard of the Lord, in the family of Christ, that your love, that your mind, that your heart are still valued and desired. It's a terribly sad thing to see an older person. Not all widows, not all widowers are old. But for this example, it's entirely sad to see an older person who has lost someone that they loved so much. And then they give up this life. They decide not to live anymore. They decide they can't live without their spouse. And they withdraw from the life around them. Such is a decision that any is free to make. But such is not the decision that the scripture is asking you to make. You have a great value and service to the church. You are loved, cared for, desired. Those around you may not understand the enduring grief. But they attempt to. And hopefully they will reach out and show you that you are not alone, though your life may have changed drastically. I only have a limited reserve of human words to give. I don't want, as we are gathered here this morning, to give you human words of wisdom to comfort or to motivate. But I'm going to use God's instead. One of my favorite sections of Scripture is in Psalm 18. If you'd like to read along with me, turn over there with me. Psalm number 18. Those who have lost a husband or a wife and are now remaking their lives into a new future. Think of these words. Imagine how you may use these words in the life that you are living. Psalm 18, beginning in verse 1. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, and whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He has heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Let all of us, to the best of our ability, in whatever life may bring us, resolve ourselves to pursue after the instruction from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. To acknowledge God in all of our ways and to allow Him to direct our paths. To those of you who have lost a husband or a wife. Those of you who have remade or are still in the process of remaking your life. Those who have lost a part of yourselves. This third point is primarily for you. The third point is concerning your legacy. Leaving your legacy. What will it be? What remembrance will you leave behind? What impact will you have on your brothers and sisters around you? It is in this third point that I appeal directly to those who are widows and widowers here with us this morning. This is a day that the elders have set aside so that you may be remembered. So that you might be loved. So that you might be honored. That's just one day out of the year. I don't know if any of us will have the thought of you that we should have the other 364 days. And that's something that the rest of us should work on. And though this day is to honor you, and though this day is to love you, and though this day is to acknowledge you, I specifically ask something from you today. Because it's today as we gather together that I tell you that the church needs you. The church needs you to teach. Would you do us this service? 
and teach us. Those who have lost a spouse, those who have endured. Those who are continually working in the kingdom and in the vineyard as wounded soldiers of the Lord. Will you do us this service and teach us? Teach us, number one, how to value. Psalm 89 and verse 47 talks about our time in this world being short. Teach us how to construct our priorities. Teach us how to understand what is truly valuable in life and to make the most of each day. Teach us not to waste the time that we have together. Too many of us assuming we may have days and months and years with our spouse. Teach us what's truly valuable in life and how to take advantage of the day that God has given us. Number two, teach us how to cope. James chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 speaks of trial and tribulations producing patience. You have had the opportunity in many ways in a greater form than those of us who have not experienced such loss to have had hardship become pressure upon you. Teach us how to use such pressure, such trials, such hardship in life that instead of crumbling under such pressure, we can be made into diamonds that shine. Teach us how to cope with hardships in life. Number three, teach us how to love. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. Paul writes that wives should respect their husbands and husbands should love their wives as themselves. Those of you who have lived and loved and lost. You have experienced love in its entirety. You've experienced all of the warts and all of the beauties of love. You've experienced love from its beginning to its physical end and love taking on a new form. Teach us to be better husbands and wives. Teach us to be more willing to compromise, to not hold grudges, to think only goodly and godly things about our husbands and our wives. Teach us to let go of petty arguments. Teach us to complain less, to care more, to mention more frequently those three words, I love you. Teach us to love. Number four, teach us to serve. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 says we should pursue peace and holiness without without which no one will see the Lord. Teach us what it means to be an enduring servant of God. Teach us what it means to be able to be willing and courageous enough to continually be active in the service of the Lord and maybe even be willing to take on new challenges and new roles as our life situation morphs and changes. Teach us to be dedicated servants of the Lord regardless of what comes upon us in life. And lastly, teach us to persevere. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Jesus says the one that overcomes, he would grant to sit with him on his throne. Teach us who have not yet learned the lesson you have learned. Who do not yet understand the life cycle of our bodies in this world as you do. Teach us how to use God, faith, and hope to get up and keep moving. Teach us how to press forward even when times are difficult. Even when we might be surrounded by darkness. Even when we might be overtaken with grief and pain. Teach us how to persevere. Teach us and show us and help us obtain the courage that is necessary to go to the next day. Those of us who have not endured such loss will not until that moment happens understand all that they are enduring and all that they have endured and the changes that are made to their lives. But we can love them, we can honor them, and if we're willing, we could be humble enough to learn from them. Before the last comment that I want to make, I'd like you all to bow with me for a moment, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. 
grateful for the opportunity that you have given us to see another day, to be surrounded by our brothers and sisters, those who love us, Heavenly Father, more than we deserve to be loved, those who are willing to do such great things for us, and those, Heavenly Father, whom hopefully we are more than willing to give of ourselves to positively affect. We pray, Father, that you would be with those of our numbers who are dealing with, whether recently or many years past, the loss of their spouse. We know, Father, that though this is a a temporary arrangement that you have created, it is a bond that you have created where love and acceptance and encouragement and value and home can be experienced in a way, Father, that no relationship on this earth can mimic or copy. We pray, Father, for those who have lost their loved ones, that they will continually be focused on you. That as they continue to keep their husbands or their wives in their memories, Father, they are motivated by their memory of them. That they will use the great value they have, Father, in service to you and in service to us. Those who have endured such loss, Father, we pray that we remember them, that we give of ourselves to them, that we help them know, Father, that even though they have lost a part of their family, they have not lost all of their family. That they will realize they are constantly surrounded by family so long as they live in this world. That they will always have a soft place to fall. That they will always have a hand to lift them up. That they will always have a heart that is extended to them. That they will always have the hope that they are surrounded by those who are continually thinking of them or praying for them. Father, we pray that you would offer them the opportunity to to serve you and to find fulfillment in the church, in you, in your word, and in service. That though they, Heavenly Father, are soldiers who live amongst other Christians who have not yet endured such loss and they carry about their wounds, they carry about their injuries, that they will find a way, Heavenly Father, through their hope, through their faith, and through their trust in you to use it, to use the life situation in which they are now to benefit those around them. Heavenly Father, we pray for those of us who have not endured such loss, that we understand the arrangement that you have set out for us, those of us who have our spouses around us, that we will value the relationships that we have, that we will learn. We pray that we will listen to those who are wiser than us, who have endured more than us. We pray, Father, that we will attempt to copy the priorities of those who have endured such pain, who understand what is truly valuable in life, that we will learn a lesson from them, Father. We pray that we will be willing to extend ourselves to them, that we will be mindful of them. We pray, Father, that we will all be gathered together in unity, in grace, and in peace, affording one another, Heavenly Father, only what the family of the Lord can afford, a love, a peace, a communion, a unity, and a place to exist and feel comfortable that is only allow that is only present that is only found in your family heavenly father we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you have given of your son that have offered us this opportunity to look beyond this life to look heavenly father to the reunion of all of those who we have lost over the years whether they are spouses whether they are friends regardless of their relationship to us heavenly father we know that there is a place where we will all be gathered together again to see the lord and to worship you and to serve you for all of eternity and we pray that those who are gathered here this morning heavenly father will live in a way so that we have that same great home and that same great hope collectively as we move forward to that goal we thank you for the sacrifice of your son heavenly father who has made all of these things possible we pray that you will forgive us for the sins that we have committed that you will help us to make better decisions help us to keep our minds focused on you help us to trust in you more heavenly father and help us to be willing to scale whatever mountains may come as we have trials and hardships, to learn lessons from each other, to lean on each other, to be closely related, Heavenly Father, with each other, loving the relationships that you have afforded us, and that we'll work together for the same goal of heaven. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you have offered for us, and we pray this through and in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Those who are surrounding us this morning, those who are wounded Christian soldiers. Let's ensure they're not forgotten. Ensure they're not overlooked. 
Ensure that do not fall out of our minds when we have a great many distractions and responsibilities in life. Let's ensure that as we read earlier in Romans chapter 13, that we give honor to whom honor and that we lift up any hands that may hang down. God has given each and every one of us the opportunity to become a part of a family, to become a part of a marriage that exists for all of eternity. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse two indicates a marriage for us to Christ that can never be broken so long as we remain close to him. So long as we obey him, hearing God's word, believing it, repenting of our past sins, confessing that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, and being baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. The Bible guarantees us that at that point, we are united with Christ in a covenant relationship that cannot be broken by anything in this life, including death, so long as we stay close to him. We look forward to the time at which that bride is reunited with her bridegroom, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. For all of eternity, having access to the tree of life, living in heaven with him where there is no need for sun nor moon because the lamb is the light of it. All of us are moving forward toward that light. If you've not made the decisions that are necessary, as God has given you that opportunity, don't wait until it's too late. Take advantage of the opportunity to gain access to that family, to be betrothed to the Lord this morning before it's too late. If you have already made that decision in your life, But something in your life is not right. Something in your relationship with God is not as it should be. And the church can help you in some way, whatever they may be. We ask this morning that if the church can assist you, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, you'll do so as we stand and as we sing. me but Savior Savior hear my humble cry while on others thou and call do not pass me by help me at the throne of mercy find a sweet relief kneeling there in deep contrition help my unbelief Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, through the spring of all more than life to me. Whom have I on her beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me by please be seated brother Phil thank you number 228 228 was saying all four verses and then the chorus at the end all four verses, and then the chorus at the end. On a hill far away stood an old 
rugged crawl, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old crawl where the dear rest and bed for a world of law set us was slain. Oh, the old rugged crawl so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, all wondra beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died. To pardon and sanctify me To the old rugged crawl I will ever be true His shame and repro gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged crow till my throne. These at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged crow and the there's anyone here that hasn't got their communion items, would you please raise your hand and they will be brought to you. This morning as we gather here to worship, an important part of that worship is to gather around this table and remember Christ as what he did for us. In the book of John, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 19, this is where Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper, this communion. And it reads, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let each of us remember what Christ did, his ultimate and his ultimate and great sacrifice for each of us. Would you all bow with me as we give thanks? Father, we humbly come before you thanking you for all that you have blessed us with in this life. But especially, Father, we are so thankful for Christ, what he gave up in heaven to come to this earth and die that we may have the hope one day of eternal life. As we partake of this bread, Father, let us remember him as he hung upon that cross. He suffered and died for our, because of his love for us. And it's through his name we pray. Amen.
Would you bow with me again, please? Again, Father, we approach you, Father, thanking you for this world and our lives in it. Father, this, this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed upon the cross, we're so thankful for his desire to do this, to help us that we may have the hope of eternal life one day with you. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, let us remember his sacrifice. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper is our, our opportunity and our chance to, uh, uh, to give back a portion of that which we've earned to the work of this church. Uh, if you desire to uh, give, uh, there's a box as you leave the auditorium. Uh, if you haven't already done so, you may drop your uh, contribution in that white box that you'll see uh, uh, in the hallway. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all of our blessings in life. We're thankful that we have uh, the opportunity to give back a portion of that which we've earned. And may the uh, proceeds of our giving be used in a manner that will be well-pleasing in thy sight, and may it uh, expand the borders of the kingdom. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, the last selection for today will be Get Right Church. We want to remind all of our widows and widowers to please come down forward. We want to spend a little time in honoring you. Let's stand together. Getting right, church, and let's go home. You better get right, church. Getting right, church, and let's go home. Getting right, church, you better get right, church. Getting right, church, and let's go home. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home, you know I'm going home. I'm going home on the morning train. Evening train may be too late. Evening train may be too late. Evening train, you know that evening train. Evening train may be too late. So back, back train and get your load. Back, back train and get your load. Back, back train, you better back, back train. Back, back train and get your load. Get right, church, and let's go home. You better get right, church. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, you better get right, church. Get right, church, and let's go home. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for everything you've done for us, dear Lord. Thank you for the good lesson we had from Brother McIntosh, and thank you for food, water, shelter, and everything, dear Lord. Please bless our widows as we're leaving church today. And blessed that they have a good day, and we all do. And as we're leaving, blessed that we drive safely back home to get lunch and dine with our families, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>